I um, stumbled across data and kind of a lot of evidence suggesting that probably the most prominent study in my field uh, in more than a decade uh, uh, basically had been fabricated from whole cloth. Uh, and um, this is a study that had really influenced my thinking and my field a lot. Um, and it had been widely reported all over the media. And so the media then had to issue retractions, which appeared on the front page of the New York Times, This American Life, everywhere else. And so what I'd like to do today is tell you that story um, and what it tells me um, about how my field um, and kind of my profession of being an academic um, needs to change and some challenges we need to, to grapple with. So it all started with this graph. Um, this was uh, a graph published in Science, the most prominent um, academic journal. Uh, and what it shows, what it purports to show, um, is the effect of having a gay person knock on your door and have a 10 minute conversation with you, um, trying to persuade you to support same sex marriage um, and personalizing themselves to you to reduce your prejudice, take people who don't support marriage equality and get them to do so. Um, in the context of a randomized controlled trial where we saw voters who had these conversations versus voters who we didn't give these conversa conversations to, like an A-B test for politics, what do they say after the fact about whether they're gonna support um, gay marriage or not? And this study was published in Science, and it was such a big deal in my field, not just because um, what this study found was that these personal conversations had huge effects on people's support for marriage equality, um, large decreases in prejudice, and, um, but moreover, that this effect lasts. Um, and that was the thing that really left me shell-shocked. Um, those of you who are in long-term relationships know that people really don't change. Uh, and moreover, those of you who have tried to get yourself to go to the gym know that it's even hard to change ourselves and our own behaviors or our own attitudes about things like prejudice when we want to. So the idea that you could have a 10-minute conversation with someone that would change them in a way that was permanent um, was a huge upset of conventional wisdom in my field and something that was kind of really exciting and uplifting in some ways. Um, so these, the study was an evaluation uh, of a program run by the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Uh, and uh, they were going door to door in Los Angeles having these conversations and I said, wow, this is such a big deal. Um, I wanna understand um, what it is that they're doing differently that's gonna upset this kind of conventional wisdom of social scientists and the broader world about um, people's stickiness and, and difficulty changing. And um, so I had this conversation with them. I said, you know, I really like to learn from what you do and do more studies with you because it seems like you're onto something great. And they said, yes, let's do it. Um, and so we started planning a study together. And in the course of doing this, as we often do in academia, we look to the literature to say, well, let me look back to this previous study that inspired me so much, and let me see if I can look through the data and understand exactly how it was done so I can retrace the steps to replicate it and extend it and test new hypotheses. And as I started looking into the data, I found some pretty weird things. And so let me talk to you about what this graph is. Um, in this data, they, uh, voters had been asked in an ostensibly unrelated survey, kind of a university research study that wasn't supposed to be connected to this door-to-door -door canvassing, both before and after these conversations, a variety of questions, one of which is what we call, it's kind of a silly question, the feeling thermometer. So we ask people, how do you feel about gay men and lesbians? Um, tell me on a zero to 100 scale where 50 means you're indifferent, 100 means you feel really warm and positive, and zero means you feel really cold and negative. And when I looked at the data and I was digging through the posted replication data, what I found is that um, people's responses were very stable. And so the x-axis here is what people said in the first interview and the y-axis is what they said a week later. Um, and basically, people moved around a little bit, but they basically gave an answer very close to what they gave before, almost always. And this was really suspicious to me. Because one of the things I know um, is that when you look at public opinion data um, using questions like this, um, this is what real data looks like. People's answers tend to bounce all around. Uh, it doesn't mean anything to ask somebody, how do you feel about gay people on a zero to 100 scale? So even if your feelings don't change at all, the answer you're gonna give um, is gonna change from day to day because you don't really know. It's not like asking your address where it's just like, this is my address. I'm not walking around with saying, oh yeah, I'm an 876 uh, so, it, because it doesn't mean anything, people's views change a lot from answer to answer. And so I knew that public opinion data looked like that. So I started getting suspicious, like, hmm, I don't think real data looks like this. And as I started getting suspicious as I was planning this next study, um, I also realized that this study wasn't just influential in academia. This was one of the rare academic studies that actually went out and influenced the real world. It turns out there's not actually that many groups like the one we're in here where academia gets to um, uh, have some impact on the broader world. This is a study that broke that barrier. And people in Ireland, as an example, who are, were reading this study and trying to adapt it to what they were doing, going door to door to reduce prejudice and try to win this historic referendum, 
uh, in this country and people all around the world in the United States um, were trying to use this research. So this was something that was important not for us to get right just on an intellectual level, but also on a practical level of people are actually using our research. Uh, and it might be wrong and just totally made up. Um, so as uh, anyone would do when they stare down something like that, um, I started drinking. Uh, and in particular, um, I started drinking with colleagues at conferences. And I said, you know, I found these really weird patterns. You know, what do you make of this? In my view, I was a graduate student at the time at Berkeley. You know, I'm just a grad student, but this seems really weird to me. And people said, um, I talked to dozens of people about this. They all said, you know, you really don't want to touch this one. Just don't, just leave it alone. Pretend you never saw it. You don't want to say anything about this. It's just going to end badly for you. And this is what they meant as I dug into it. What they said is, you know, in academia, it's, and this is, you know, a new scientist or social scientist being trained. This is the message that I got from, you know, everyone older than me. It's, of course, the norm to kind of criticize research in a way where you're just criticizing the research. Well, there's all this existing data out there, and I have a new theory to explain it. Or um, people thought we could only do this well, but I have some improvement, or I interpret the data a different way. And a lot of my research is some form of that. Like, well, existing data has this problem. Here's a new idea. I think academia is really good at that. It's very inbounds to say there's a problem with research, and I'm going to make it better. The issue is anytime you're criticizing the researcher, the norms are very different. If I'm not just saying, well, I, I don't think your data shows what you say it does, but you made up that data, you lied, or you're not telling us everything, or you messed up, all of a sudden the conversation is very different. If you're saying that about someone who's at the same level as you, people say, oh, well, this person is just trying to throw elbows and get ahead. So um, the person who uh, we believe made up this data was also applying for jobs at the same time that I was. They say, well, of course, you're just trying to cynically reduce his chances at getting a good job. You don't really care about the truth. If it's someone who's more senior than you, the story is, well, you're just picking on this other famous professor because you want attention for yourself. If the, someone more junior than you, or you're a senior famous professor and it's a graduate student who you say, well, you messed up, well, come on, lay off. Like, they're just getting their career started. Don't be mean. Um, and moreover, no matter what level it is in this social reality of academia, what if you're wrong? And you say, well, I think this person made up data, but they're innocent. So there really wasn't a way for someone who had the suspicions but not confirmation I had to really do much other than get tanked at a conference and ask people, like, what should I do? So that's sort of where we were. Um, and that status quo means that, you know, we know researchers are human to make mistakes. Peer review really does not catch all that much. And when we do meta-analysis of research, it seems like most published research is actually wrong. And if any of you work at Genentech or any other biotech firms, you know that um, when folks in Silicon Valley go try to use the articles in Science and Nature saying we've discovered this new um, biological process, they often can't replicate the basic results um, the majority of the time. So we have this big issue in science where like, we're not actually producing the truth we're supposed to, and yet someone in my position who has figured out that something seems to be wrong um, isn't able to do anything about it. What happens is exactly what would have happened in my case had um, something I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about in a second not happened, which is that people tell their colleagues about their concerns and it kind of spreads in the social world of academia to say, well, you know, everyone's heard, everyone knows that paper doesn't really replicate. But that's kind of messed up. And science deserves a lot better than that. First of all, the authors can't respond. There's these whisper campaigns against other people's research that might or might not be right. And maybe there's a good explanation for why the data looks the way it does or why you should think about the theorem a different way or whatever else. Moreover, the public, people who get together and try to say, I want to use academic research in my work, don't know. So when academics say everybody knows, what they really mean is academics who work at the top 10 universities have heard this at conferences, but nobody who's actually going to use the research is ever going to hear about that, which really makes a mockery of this whole idea of open science and that what we're supposed to be doing is going to be helping the public good. And so um, it ultimately ended up that this sort of weird status quo I was in where I wasn't sure what to do, um, something forced my hand, which is that we started doing the follow-up study. Uh, in Miami, Florida, and we sent out these survey invitations. We started doing um, the whole idea of getting people into the survey, seeing what their prejudice was, in this case, on a study about transgender people. Um, and we couldn't really get it to work that well. Um, and I wasn't worried that it wasn't replicating in the sense of, you know, two chemicals aren't combining, but I just could tell, you know, we're not going to succeed at the rate we're at. We're not getting enough people to agree. We're not getting them to give the right kind of opinions we need. And so I went to the company um, that earlier the original researcher had told me, oh, here's the company that I worked with. And I had a forwarded email uh, where the, a salesperson at this company called uh, USAMP, which to be clear was not involved as far as I know, now we know, a salesperson at this company, USAMP, had said, well, here's the specifications, and he had forwarded this email to me to say, here's the company I worked with. So I called this company, and I said, I really need your help. I heard that you did this previous study. I'm trying to follow the public 
um, replication details, it's clear there was something you were doing as the contractor to implement the surveying that you know, I can't figure out, can you help me? And they said, well, we don't really do studies of that type, and moreover, no one with this name has ever worked here, so uh, you must have some wrong information. So that's when things flipped from maybe something's messed up to something definitely is wrong. Um, and over the course of, I don't have enough time to go into it, but over the course of the next few days, we started really looking at the data in a critical way. Me and my co-author, Josh Kalla, working on this project, um, we realized, wow, a lot of stuff actually really does not add up. Um, that's when Armand, at the back of the room here, CTO of HashiCorp, were walking around our apartment in the mission, and I'm like, you know, what are we gonna do? You know, we found basically not just like, maybe evidence, but pretty definitive evidence, uh, in our view, that something is really messed up here. Um, and so what are we supposed to do? And we're walking around my apartment and Armand says, well, in computer science we have this idea called responsible disclosure. And what we were thinking is, you know what, we're just gonna post a PDF of what we found, because all my colleagues are saying, never say anything about this, don't do anything. I think one of my, one of my professors told me, this is not the hill you wanna die on. It's like, that's what he said. Um, uh, and so, and Armand said, you know, you know, you don't wanna just put this out there in public because you know, this guy might be innocent, there might be an explanation, and that's not gonna kind of really look you know, responsible. Um, and so we started thinking about, well, what are kind of some of these principles uh, in the kind of computer science world of responsible disclosure that even though it's not really quite the same situation, um, actually gave us some insight into what we thought we should do. So the first thing we did is we said, you don't just kind of like post the vulnerability, you like tell it to the person, you find some way to give advance notice so that the problem can be fixed. Um, and in this case, on the other hand, you don't wanna give so much time that the problem can be exploited. And what that meant to us was, um, this guy, Monday morning, um, the 18th of May, was sat down and said, um, by his graduate advisor, and said, we think your data's fake. You need to prove that this, any of the research you described actually happened. One receipt, one, you know, anything, something in your uh, email account to suggest that any of these people actually did this survey. Uh, and as far as I know, over the course of 48 hours, nothing persuasive materialized. Um, then, um, on Tuesday night, the co-author of the study, who wasn't involved in the original data collection, um, sent a memo to science saying, the co-author, you know, my co-author can't produce any of the original data, therefore I've come to believe that the study didn't actually happen. Um, and we, a few hours after that happened, released a timeline of our involvement and laid out all the data analysis we had done. So that meant, on the one hand, that um, this person who made up the data, as far as we can tell, um, this person didn't have time to come up with more alternative stories. Um, but yet did have enough time to say, okay, given um, the charge against you, is there any evidence you can come up with? And we're also under time pressure because there's all this work being done out in the real world based on this study and money we were gonna be recommend, um, that we were recommending be spent um, on the basis of it that we just didn't feel okay staying silent about. So we had this timeline where we could say, here's what we have, here's what we did, we're happy to um, you know, defend our actions, um, but we also had this confidential period where we were able to kind of investigate what was going on and, and try to fix it. Um, so that to me got me thinking about kind of some of these broader problems um, and the kind of what I want to, what I view as the next step here is to think about um, not necessarily what would have fixed this instance because it's kind of rare, but the broader issues that this touches on. Um, and I think what we need in academia is something that looks a bit like um, responsible disclosure, um, which is that we need to first acknowledge the human realities that criticizing your peers and calling them potential liars is really uncomfortable um, and potentially disastrous for all parties. Um, and you have to be really careful about something like that. On the other hand, that people are lazy, um, and you need something like a bug bounty. Uh, people are not just gonna always be looking into the problems in academic research, but they need to feel like there's something in it for them. That there's something they can get out of it, like a publication, or whatever the or other currency of academia is. Uh, and on the other hand, researchers need time to respond and react before things go public. You don't just post the vulnerability, that's not disclosed, that's not responsible. You find some way to really figure out if it's, uh, how it can be fixed and make sure um, that it's real. On the other hand, you don't wanna have so much time um, that other people, um, basically uh, uh, sort of third parties are hurt by the fact that you haven't disclosed it. Um, and so what I think we need in academia is some kind of um, responsible disclosure type institution that means that someone who is in my position who has these concerns about research would have a way of investigating them um, that didn't have some of these uh, problems. And what I'm proposing is a system where there can be confidential and anonymous communication um, that can be made public retroactively, much the same way as happened um, with bugs, where afterwards you say, oh, this person, here is their, here is their communication with Google or Facebook, um, and after the fact, it's all open. And so that's the idea I have. And here's how I'm imagining that it, it works. 
So we start off, um, I would send an email to, let's say, one of you and say, hey, I, I think there's this aspect of your paper where the data doesn't look quite right. right. This doesn't look like any other data I've ever collected. Can you explain this? And that, data, that message would be totally confidential. Um, you wouldn't know it's coming from, um, and it, anonymous, you wouldn't know it's coming from me. So this message would not be public. You would just say, sort of like getting an email through the Craigslist email relay. Someone's communicating to you through this system. We can't tell you who it is, but don't worry. It's not public right now. And then we can talk back and forth, and I can say, does this make sense? Is there some alternative explanation for this? Why is this? Then each of us have an option. If I decide this person is really not responding, um, well, I think I found a real issue. They're not providing me a satisfactory explanation. I'm at the point where I'm willing to go public with this. I can go public. And all of our correspondence back and forth will be retroactively public. On the other hand, the author can also go public, but they can't forcibly reveal my identity as the critic. And the key idea here is, on the one hand, there's not going to be anonymous public criticism. So people can't just go say, hey, so-and-so is a liar, and start a whisper campaign using this tool, which is what people are sort of forced to do now. On the other hand, we can lower the potential for retribution that causes people to go anonymous and not really be able to have these back and forth conversations by saying in the downside risk case, in the case that you're wrong and the person's innocent, they can't forcibly reveal who you are. So it's only if you're comfortable revealing who you are that your name is gonna be attached to your critique. On the other hand, you can't just put it out there in public. You have to actually stand up behind it if you're willing to do so. And if you do so, you can be rewarded because the currency of academia really is reputation. So if you're someone that says, wow, you really did a lot of work to go through that data and see if it replicated, you find out, you found out that it didn't and you did something about it, what I've experienced is you really do get rewarded for that within academia. It's just a really scary place at the beginning when you're not sure how things are gonna turn out. Um, so that's the basic idea I have for kind of a communications type system where I think, um, and I think you guys, uh, uh, for those of you who are here, the last papers we love about um, information escrows saw, there are these broader ideas about how we can try to use technology to aggregate information and exchange messages in ways that we couldn't really before um, to try to kind of protect people's identities. So those are some of the broader issues here. So the pitch I have to you all and the remaining time I have left is just to say um, our next step is to try to basically see if we're crazy or not. Um, to try to build a beta of this and start it out at a small scale. There's a few academics across the country who are interested in this idea. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. We want to see if we start this off at a small scale, can we actually find out that there are some problems in papers um, and do all the dynamics and incentives actually work out well and kind of iteratively learn what works and what can we do better. Um, one thing I will say is that every academic that I've told this about has said to me, oh my God, I need this. And I didn't really realize this before I went through this experience, but almost every person I know in academia has at least one, if not multiple papers, where they've said, I've always walked around with this burden of thinking this paper is wrong in some important way. Um, and in some important way that is so fundamental that I feel like it would be a personal attack on the author in some way, or viewed as a personal attack, to try to raise a critique of, did you do something just wrong um, that would make you look dumb, and not just, oh, I had a new idea you didn't have. And so people say to me, there's so many critiques I'd like to make of papers people actually use, but I don't have any way to do that right now um, that is going to protect me um, if, uh, if I'm wrong and protect them um, if, if, uh, if, um, and protect them if I'm wrong. So um, a lot of people really feel like they need this, and so I'd like to try it. Um, so part of what I'm here to say is that I'm looking for people who actually know how to build software uh, to help build this and try it. Um, and we're going to, I think, probably get a small grant to do this um, and hopefully put together an open source project um, to try to just try this in a few uh, empirical um, methods and statistical classes this fall and next spring to try to see, does this work? Um, there's a lot of classes around the country that build into their curriculum the idea of looking into data in previous papers. And as far as I know from talking to the people who run those classes, their students find issues all the time, but then the teachers say responsibly, yeah, you probably don't want to do anything with this because you, know, you might get on hot water and it's going to look bad and all these negative stories are going to come about you. So my idea is what a great place um, then in those moments where people already have data that they feel like is a problem to go back um, and use some beta of a system to see does it actually help make, make things better. So um, that's what I like to try, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you all are the kind of community that came up with this idea of how to disclose these quote unquote vulnerabilities um, uh, insofar as the metaphor works. So I'd love to hear what you think um, and hopefully get some of your help. Thanks.
Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I want to make sure I understood it. So basically the question is, suppose we have a conversation back and forth, I'm criticizing your paper and I say, and you say, oh yeah, you're right, you found a problem, you're totally right. Um, yeah, I'll post an erratum that, you know, that table was done wrong, here's the updated table. Um, can I then, as the, um, as the critic, say, hey, I was the one who figured, out, figured this out? Yes, yes, so I think, and this is, I, I think totally they should be in two ways. One is, some people have said to me, well, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable communicating anonymously with my colleagues, so I would want to reveal my identity confidentially at the beginning, and I think that's fine. Um, we could have a way where you could just say, um, I know this is, we have, I have the option to be anonymous if I want, but it's not like forced anonymity. It's just um, a tool we'll give you, um, and the, the idea is, there's this third, ultimately it's the idea is there's a third party that if you wish, can certify that all this communication you were having was in fact you, um, but if you want to sort of reveal it's you and not take advantage of that um, uh, revocable anonymity, you can certainly do that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, I, I failed to do that last time. Um, <laughs> I have to repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, uh, ultimately, uh, as my previous answer indicated, like you need some trust in whoever this centralized authority is. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear what you think about that. I think ultimately um, the idea would be um, that uh, there's something like it's, a, it's something hosted at like some Stanford subdomain where everybody just says, okay, I mean, academia is one big web of trust and you just say, oh, I know the people running that. I trust that they're not like en masse forging stuff and then after you know 10 or 20 of these come forward and people don't retroactively say hey that wasn't me um, then then things are all right so but I think that'd be the idea and I think another thing that would really help um, I mean emails are a great way that we you know manage identity in today's world so if we can if that system if you trust that system the way that system can then certify it's really these people is people need to be using their like edu email addresses that are like listed on their website so we really know it's, it's them Yeah. 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 So to make sure I understand the question and to repeat it, um, the question is, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, might there be an issue where um, uh, if we create this new set of incentives, there's gonna be this huge avalanche of criticism going left and right that's gonna create sort of chaos? Or Yeah. Yeah, so it would sort of hurt academia in some ways if, if, if everybody knows how much we lie, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, uh, and I mean, I think, you know, I think it's sort of an empirical question that we don't know the answer to is like, how much of this is there out there? Um, I started this all, whole, all off thinking, well, you know, outright lying is pretty rare, but there's, these, m there's much more common subtle forms of dishonesty. Um, so for example, people will um, run 10 different statistical models and then report the one that looks the best and say, oh, well, that's the one I was planning to do all along. Um, or um, and there's lots and lots of versions of that. Or like, I'm not gonna present this other variable, just this variable, or blah, blah, blah. Just the list goes on. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of that. Um, and um, I think uh, the world would be better if there were less of it. And so my idea, it, my thought is, there might be some period um, where, um, you know, certain people who have done this in their career um, are gonna have some problems, I guess. Um, but I think also um, there is this understanding that norms are changing. And 20 years ago, people didn't actually understand the idea that, for example, it's not good to run 10 different statistical specifications and report the best one. Um, like that just, that, I mean, it sounds obvious now, but like back then it wasn't, there wasn't a norm that you're not supposed to do that. Um, so I think there's some extent to which you, you know, like in a lot of domains of life, we look back in history and say, well, let bygones be got bygones. So I think people will be willing to do that for older papers to say, oh, we didn't really know that at the time. They probably also won't have the data around if it's 20 years ago and whatever. Um, um, so, so I guess it's a long way of saying, uh, I'm not really sure. 
Um, and uh, I hope that those kinds of problems are rare enough that this is not a big issue. Um, but I also hope they're common enough that it's useful, and also that this is kind of normalized. Um, that, um, you know, the flip side of it is to say that if everybody learns in academia, oh, wait a minute, we all make mistakes, um, then I don't think that's bad. Um, I think actually it would be good if people feel more comfortable saying, yeah, it's a normal thing that I worry that you kind of messed up something in your R code of, for making your tables, um, because that kind of stuff happens. Uh, and so um, I'm hoping we get to a place where everyone just adjusts their expectations correctly and everyone feels the incentives to kind of do the best job they can. But the problem is the same, right? You just like announced Yes. So like, what exactly in the process of reviewing the paper was actually given to you? Like, if you yes. look at a piece of code, it wasn't like code. Yeah, so one of the things I learned is that apparently non-academics think peer review does anything. Um, uh, which it does not. Uh, <laughs> um, so what peer review, d yeah. <laughs> Uh, so peer review, so peer review can do things. Um, uh, and you know, in some fields I think it, it serves a more important function than others. Um, you know, in my experience, a lot of what peer review does is um, you know, it guards against like the craziest things where you say, oh, I analyzed this data and have this interpretation. People say, well, it really didn't, doesn't have that interpretation. But especially, I mean, in my field it's bad enough. In other fields it's really hard. In the hard sciences, for example, if I say, I have this machine, and if I do, like, create this chemical compound in this machine, like it cures cancer, if you don't have one of those machines and you're reviewing the paper, you can't really like, reproduce it yourself. Um, so there's a lot of, and in the same way here, it's not the norm in social science to share data or look through it. And even then, I mean, hundreds of people had worked with this data before anyone just like made the graph that I showed you and was like, huh, that's messed up. Um, and so uh, I don't think there's a lot of people out there right now who like have a skeptical eye when they're looking at data. And in peer review, they're certainly not incentivized and it's not the norm to ask that question. Partly because that kind of fraud, I think, is very rare. Um, and what's more common is um, the kind of thing that is even harder to detect in peer review where it's like, you only wrote up one of the variables in your data set, did you collect other variables? And so I wanna see, and so like I do this in my peer reviews and people of course love it. You know, I wanna see the original questionnaire. Are you just showing me one variable or are there others you have? And so there's this whole movement afoot in academia to try to actually get people to be better at that and to say, I want you to register your design in advance, I want you to register your statistical model in advance, what your hypothesis is, that way you can't after the fact say, oh we had this theory all along that um, you know, women over 65 who lived in Kansas that we have two of in our sample would look in this, this distinctive way, which is like the type of papers we're living with right now. So there's an idea to sort of clamp down on that, but in some ways, this is an interesting, sorry not to ramble on, but this is an interesting case because this study actually, what people said is, well, this guy was Mr. Transparency. There's been all of these um, new norms in academia about post your um, replication data and code, post the um, in advance analysis plan you have, in this case, this was actually all done. So everyone said, well, of course, this is gonna be squeaky clean because all of the new research transparency norms, this person is following. And these are the very norms that let you um, discover if there's um, hijinks and, and fraud of various kinds. But I guess what people didn't take into account was like the equilibrium um, effect of that, the incentive is, if everybody just assumes, well, if you do that, I can trust you. Like, if you're someone who wants to commit a lie, what better way than to do all those things and then have no one suspect you? So it was kind of hiding in plain sight, um, which I think is depressing insofar as um, it suggests that all these new transparency measures and all this stuff we talk about in academia, about transparency, replication data, whatever, if we don't actually have a way if, to, if we discover there's something wrong in those materials, do anything about it, then like why are we doing it? And if anything, it might be counterproductive because now everyone thinks we're nice and transparent when in reality, um, you know, when you find issues, you can't do anything or it's very hard. So, um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, would this uh, re potentially like replace scientific journals in some way? Um, so that's a much broader question of like what should the future of scientific journals be and you know, I don't 
no, um, what the right answer is there. Um, I will say um, academia is certainly changing its norms um, in that regard. That I mean, almost every paper I write, you know, I post it on my website, and and you know, it has the impact it's going to have long before I go through the long arduous peer review process. Um, and a lot of peer review in academia, sadly, is really about indexing, like, how big of a deal is this paper? How important is it? Does it deserve to belong in this journal or that journal? And it's all this process of, like, coming to a collective verified judgment about, like, how good the work is, um, or how novel it is, or interesting, or whatever. So um, I think there's ways in which you could imagine, like, technology could do a better job of that than, than academic journals could. Um, with that said, um, I think, I guess my view in life in general is like start small and then grow from there. Um, and I'm not sure what will happen when we start this. Um, I don't know if, like the previous questioner asked, maybe all of a sudden we're going to realize that like we know nothing and everything's fake, or if we're going to realize, oh, this isn't actually that big of a deal, and um, uh, you know, all these people who have told me they have concerns about paper uh, papers, actually those alternative explanations, and we're fine. I'm not sure where we're going to be there. Um, I do think though that. You know, anytime you make a new technology available like this, it's really hard to predict all the great ways that people might use it. Um, and so um, giving people the option to have this kind of communication they can't have now, um, I totally think might open up um, ways in which people will you know, understand how it can be used in a different way. Um, one last thing I'll say on that is that um, one question I do get um, is, um, can't peer review deal with this? Why not? Why, why didn't I just write to science and say, I have a two-page paper that has all these graphs we have. Why didn't I just submit a reply to science saying, the thesis of this article or this research note is that the previous research was made up? Um, why not do that? Um, and um, that's done sometimes um, in, in smaller cases where people say, if you analyze the data differently, the results are not robust or whatever else. Um, and But part of the issue in general is that it's a lot of work to write up a peer-reviewed journal article. Um, this is like the least favorite part of my job is sitting there and saying, I already did this study. Now I need to like write 20 pages about what I did, go back through my old notes, be like, oh, what was that survey question? It's just a, a huge pain. Um, and those high costs, in addition to the current like low benefits, um, are part of what deters people from saying, hey, I wonder about this. And so um, uh, I think it should be easier for people to say, hey, I have a question. Like, this uh, graph doesn't really make sense. Can you explain it? Um, I think that should be a lot easier to do than I'm going to spend months and months writing up an article because people just won't do that. They'd rather focus on what they're doing. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, got it, I remember to repeat it, I'm trained now, it's good, right as I get the last one. Uh, the question was, uh, this was a really extreme case along a lot of dimensions. Um, it was extremely high profile, it really impacted the real world in a serious way, and as far as we all can tell, um, the extent of the deceit was basically total. Um, and uh, whereas a lot of times there's academic papers that like, I don't know, like kind of matter, but probably not. And like, there's like a little bit of lying, maybe, but like there's, you know, is it really lying? I don't know, maybe it's a mistake, who knows, right? And that's, and actually, I think that's exactly um, uh, the kind of thing that this would address. Um, in that, um, in some ways, I actually don't think in our particular circumstance, given the high profile nature of it, given that, um, you know, I communicated with this person a lot about how to replicate the study, and I realized, oh, wait a minute, all, the whole time I've been like letting down, I've been, I've been led down this like, led into this web of lies. Um, that's a really rare circumstance. I think the much more common circumstance is, hey, I downloaded the data and I don't get the same results you do, can you explain it? Um, and it's not because someone's really made up everything, it's because there's like this smaller set of dishonesty, um, which sort of connects to my previous answer in the sense that because the cases are so much less high profile so often, and because the issues are so, are, are less major, um, you wouldn't feel the need, or you wouldn't feel the, the impetus to say, I'm gonna spend two months of my life writing this up. It's just not worth it, it's not a big enough deal. But collectively, all those little small deals add up to something big. Um, when we go back and say, what is the state of the research literature? Um, if there's all these little errors that add up, um, they add up into academia telling kind of a collective lie. Um, 
There's a the last thing I'll say is if, if you're interested in that idea, there's a really great paper um, by an uh, academic who publishes anonymously called Neuroskeptic, and it's called The Nine Circles of Academic Hell, um, I believe. Okay, how long is this? You have five minutes. Okay, it's not my paper, but I'll show it to you. But anyway, but the basic idea is in academia, we're all stuck in purgatory where we see each other's lies, we see each other's lies, but we don't like call it out. Um, and uh, sort of this is what I think of as kind of a way to get out of that and say, you know, we all kind of want to be honest about the, the problems we see. So. All right. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. So if anybody wants more drinks, now will be a time to, to get some. Um, and I'm going to introduce Bob. So should I give you two minutes to get drinks? Okay, two minutes. should work. Um, okay. And this is what's on the screen behind you, so you can actually see what's up there. Right, so advance slide, and advance back. back. Again. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, is there anywhere I have to stand to make a microphone work? Um, or? You need to be relatively close. You can okay. take it off if you prefer to walk around. But you can always, yeah. Okay. Still, uh, cool. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I will. I, I did uh, for your thing. Bonded okay. Yeah, it's nothing crazy. Okay. It's not okay. Crazy. Not really that crazy, but somebody else picked it. So okay. We were like brainstorming today. Uh huh. So. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Oh. So um, just till like people come back to their chairs. Uh, if you want to do a mini for next year. Uh, we're covered till December, but if you want to do something, it would be great. You can let me know, and then I can help you with anything that you need in terms of like content development and everything. So, so if you're interested, it's a really good way to get started. So we recommend it. And um, another thing that I was told is that the doors lock at 8, but if you need to use the restroom, you can let us know, and we can let you back in. And there's going to be cupcakes after Bob's talk. So... So if you take your seats, then I can introduce them to you. Uh, shall, shall I start now? Yeah. So Bob is wearing the coolest shirt for his cool talk, so I would like to highlight that. It's really, really good. Uh, so here's about Bob. Bob works at the intersection of data mining and databases at Factual, and he got hooked on CS papers after reading the Academia paper in high school while trying to figure out how Kazaa worked. Bob is an award winner Elvis impersonator and also does weird stuff with image processing at Aquil Bot, probably being the most popular example. So let's give it up for Bob. Okay. Um, so, hi. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Cool Cat, uh, which is by these people here uh, Daniel Barbara, Julio Kuto, uh, and Yi Li. Uh, but first, this is me. I'm Bob. Uh, I write software. Um, I've written a bunch of different kinds of software, but lately I've been doing data mining, and so this is going to be a data mining paper. Um, and I think this is actually the first data mining paper we've had at, at Papers We Love. Um, so uh, that's cool. Um, and specifically, this is going to be uh, an entity resolution paper. Uh, there are an unfortunate number of names for entity resolution, so uh, it's called entity resolution, it's called identity resolution, it's called categorical clustering, it's called record linkage. Uh, but basically all of those things are trying to solve the uh, one of these things is not like the others problem. 
um, credit Sesame Street. So um, basically the problem is we have a set of records that we got from somewhere uh, and we want to figure out which one of them or which ones of them represent the same thing uh, and which ones of them represent different things. Uh, and this comes up in a bunch of different places. Uh, but to, to show just a few uh, use cases where this comes up, uh, the first one um, and why it's called, one of the things it's called is record linkage down there, uh, is joining two data sets together. So uh, let's say, for example, that you thought that uh, for every product that existed on Etsy, there's something that's almost the same that exists on eBay, and you could get a better deal if you got it on eBay, and so you wanted to make a website where people could find cheaper prices for Etsy things on eBay, and so you wanted to scrape all of Etsy, scrape all of eBay, figure out for each Etsy listing what are all the eBay listings that are the same. Um, and so, you know, that's an entity resolution problem or a record linkage problem. You're trying to link the eBay records with the Etsy records. Uh, another uh, use case and why one of the things that it's called is identity resolution uh, is trying to figure out uh, which people are the same person and which people are different pr people. So. Uh, Let's say that you're a bank and uh, people are trying to sign up for credit cards at your bank um, and you wanna catch people uh, trying to sign up for credit cards under other people's names, right? And so uh, they give you a name, they give you an address maybe, they give you some bits and pieces of information um, and you know, maybe their name is John Doe and you can't tell who they are from their name because there are too many John Does uh, and maybe you know, they give you an address that other people have had and it's kind of fuzzy. Um, and so you want to somehow be able to figure out, okay, you know, this person filled out this form and they are this John Doe. Um, so it's another application. And then the uh, third more ambitious application is, uh, let's say we want to group web pages into topics. So um, let's say hypothetically we wanted to make algorithmic Wikipedia. So we wanted to make a piece of software that made Wikipedia for us out of the internet without having people write it. Um, and so maybe a way that we could do that is we would crawl the web, uh, we would take each web page, we would uh, extract the bits and pieces of information uh, from all those web pages, and then we would try to group those web pages into, uh, together to say, okay, here are all the web pages that are about, let's say, Beethoven. Uh, you know, we know that all these web pages are about the same thing, they all happen to be Beethoven, so we make one topic page for that, uh, that group for Beethoven, and it contains the sum total of all human knowledge about Beethoven. Um, so that would be another ridiculously ambitious application that actually some startups kind of tried like five years ago and none of them are around anymore. But um, that's the thing. Um, so if you've, if you've done some machine learning or if, you know, you're a little bit familiar with machine learning, you, you might be uh, familiar with classification, which is, is kind of similar to this. Um, but like I said before, this is categorical clustering, which is a kind of clustering. Uh, and there's a big difference between uh, clustering and classification. So basically, uh, if you're doing classification, what you're trying to do is say, okay, I know what kinds of things there are. Like, let's say, for example, that we're trying to tell cats from dogs, right? So I, I the human, know that there are things called dogs. And I, the human, know that there are things called cats. And I have a bunch of training examples that I've hand labeled, like these things here are cats and these things here are dogs. And the only job that the learning algorithm has to do uh, is figure out what traits are specific to cats and what traits are specific to dogs. So when it sees a new thing, it can tell whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. Um, and it's been given a lot of stuff by the human, right? It knows, it knows that there are cats and there are dogs and it has labeled training examples. And those labeled training examples are a huge pain in the butt to get. And so uh, clustering says, A, we don't need labels. And B, uh, we don't even need to know what kinds of things there are. Like in some cases you need to know how many kinds of things there are, but you don't need to know what those kinds of things are. The algorithm figures out, figures this out uh, all on its own. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, and uh, also this is categorical clustering, right? As opposed to regular old plain old clustering. So you, you, know, you might have heard of or used uh, an algorithm like k-means uh, or, or maybe like dbscan. Um, and uh, the big difference between uh, categorical clustering and uh, clustering algorithm like k-means uh, is regular, cluster alg regular clustering algorithms uh, work on numeric vectors. So you have to somehow figure out like, okay, I'm building a real system. I got some mess from somewhere. 
Like I, I, I wrote a web crawler or whatever. Um, and I didn't get numbers back. I got text or I got images or you know, I got something that you would normally think of being in a file, right? Um, and I have to figure out now, okay, I have my, my clustering algorithm wants a space, right? It wants everything to get turned into coordinates. What the heck does that mean? Like, what does it mean for an image to be in a space? And, and like, there are lots of answers to that question, um, but they're all really complicated. Um, and uh, in categorical clustering, we're not dealing in uh, numeric vectors, we're dealing in basically data records. So the only thing we need to give to the clustering algorithm um, is basically, here's a struct, right? Here's something that looks like a database row. Um, and that's a lot more natural to work with. You have to do a lot less massaging. Um, the, the sort of process of taking uh, real data that you saw and turning it into these numeric vectors is called feature engineering. And it's, it's where, if you do machine learning, it's where almost all of the work goes. Um, and if you're doing categorical clustering, um, if you're doing you know, entity resolution, you can just put in, uh, put in data records. You don't need to do that. So uh, that's also pretty cool. So uh, here's an example of uh, the kind of data you might want to uh, you know, use uh, an entity resolution algorithm like CoolCat on. So um, this is actually uh, data that you can get from uh, that website there at the University of Leipzig. Um, it's a scrape, it's a pretty tiny scrape, but uh, it's a scrape from uh, Amazon.com of products and it's a scrape from Google products of products. Um, and let's say uh, our goal, right, was to, you know, like I said before, you might want to scrape all of Etsy and scrape all of eBay and figure out what products were the same from Etsy and eBay. Let's say that we wanted to scrape all of Amazon and scrape all of Google products and figure out what products were the same between Amazon and Google products, right? Let's say that we thought that uh, it was possible to find cheaper prices for things on Google products and on Amazon and like we want to make a browser extension that helps people do that or whatever. So uh, this is actually real data that you can download. Um, and it looks like this. And so it has uh, these IDs. Uh, and you, know, you might think, oh, awesome. I can just link these together by seeing if the IDs are the same. But it turns out that the IDs are specific to one or the other place. So they're either Amazon, Amazon IDs or uh, Google IDs. Um, and so none of them are equal between Amazon and Google. And so they help you actually not at all. Um, so you basically chuck it away. Um, there are these titles, which are some text. There are these some, uh, descriptions, uh, which are some more text. Uh, there are these uh, manufacturers, which are a pretty small chunk of text. Uh, and there are these prices, which are numbers. And so, okay. Let's say we have these and we want to figure out, right, for each, each product, there are, you know, this particular piece of accounting software, there are 50 different listings that are worded slightly differently for each of the places that represent uh, this particular piece of accounting software. Um, how do we figure out that they're the same? Um, well, the first step is we need to get the data out of this sort of JSON record form um, and into this attribute value pair set form. Um, so instead of having, you know, title is a key, which is a special, you know, key thing, um, and then the value is this big old string, PHP by Sage Premium Accounting, um, we turn it into attribute value pairs where you know, we have title, and title shows up twice, so it's, it's totally okay uh, to have multiple values for the same key. Um, and this big old text string here, we can't just leave that as a big text string because later on we're gonna wanna be doing uh, equality comparisons. And uh, like, it's very unlikely that there's gonna be another listing for this piece of accounting software that's gonna have that exact string there. Like, it's just too long. Um, so we tokenize it. So, you know, each word we, turn into a, se a separate record. So um, instead of having that big thing, we have you know, title peach tree, title sage, and then obviously we do the rest. We would do like title premium, title accounting, title nonprofits, et cetera. Do the same thing for the description. So we would have description premium, description peach tree, description accounting, description nonprofits, description blah, 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 you know, all the rest of them. Uh, manufacturer is actually pretty small. So that we can probably just leave. Um, and pass straight through, so we get manufacturer save software, or save software, sorry. Um, and then price, we just leave, okay. So now we took these records, right, we took these documents, and we turned them into these sets of these attribute value pairs. So now we have a pile of these sets. Okay, so now what do we do? Well, CoolCat um, does something based on 
uh, entropy. Um, and entropy is a really useful concept. It, it comes up a lot, actually. Um, I'm talking specifically about Shannon information theory entropy, not the chemistry thing. Um, and uh, so we're using entropy, and, and what is entropy? Um, basically, you can think of entropy as, it's, it's described uh, several different ways. Some people describe it as uh, the amount of noise in something. Some people describe it as uh, the amount of data in something. Um, I usually like to think of it as how difficult is it to compress something. So uh, something that is extremely high entropy, if you run it through gzip, it gets bigger because uh, there's no repetition. So how does compression work? Uh, it finds repeated patterns, right? And instead of having those repeated patterns repeated in the file, um, it represents them just once and it references them in all the places where they're supposed to show up. Um, if something's really high entropy, uh, then there are not gonna be any repeated patterns. And so there's gonna be nothing to compress. So the highest entropy thing you can get, you know, if you're representing images, right, the highest entropy image you can have is white noise. Um, it's pure random, no patterns anywhere. Uh, the lowest entropy thing you can have is just a solid color, right? Because that's just a single value repeated. And so if we wanted to say, okay, we know that things are solid colors, we wanna compress them, you could just say, here's the color, here's how many times. And you could replace the millions of pixels that you have in your image with, you know, what is it? Four bytes of color and then four bytes of how many times? And it's like millions, millions of times compression, right? So that would be extremely low entropy. Um, and then like a picture of a tree would be somewhere in the middle. There are some patterns in there. Uh, maybe we could, you know, use a more restricted color palette so we don't have to have uh, as many pits as many bits per pixel because uh, there aren't gonna be as many colors that it's possible to have. Maybe there are some patterns in the leaves or whatever that we can represent. So there's, a, there's gonna be some compression, but it's not gonna be like we take the entire image and we turn it into eight bytes. Um, so the actual like definition, I, I, I like to think of it as almost, this is not quite true, but it's almost uh, the opposite of the amount of repetition. So the more repetition something has, the less entropy it has, and the less repetition it has, the more entropy it has. Uh, that's not quite true because of that log thing in there, but um, this is the actual you know, Shannon entropy formula. And uh, it's just, you take, for each thing that shows up, uh, you take, okay, how many times uh, does that thing show up? How many times are there occurrences of things in general and divides, that's how you get that probability. Um, and then you multiply it by its log, uh, and then you add up all those, and you take the opposite. And so um, if that log thing wasn't there, this formula would literally just be the opposite of the amount of repetition. Um, so yeah, it's basically how, how much structure is there? How, how little, or uh, yeah, how little do things repeat? Um, so why do we care? Why, what is, why, why is this entropy thing uh, at, useful at all for what we're doing? So uh, CoolCat starts from uh, this basic intuition, which is um, if I have a set of key value pairs and I wanna add that set of key value pairs uh, to another set of key value pairs, right? If we go back to, to what our actual goal is, uh, we wanna figure out what things we can say are the same and what things are different. So we wanna say, okay, how good is it to merge these two documents together? Um, and entropy helps us answer that question. Um, so the intuition is if merging two documents together um, doesn't increase the entropy of the resulting document, right? If the entropy of the merged document isn't higher than uh, the entropy of the individual documents, then they probably represented the same thing. Um, another way of thinking th of that is uh, if there's a lot of overlap, um, if the sort of attribute value pairs in A um, and attribute value pairs in B, most of them are in both, um, and there aren't very many that are in one and not the other, then they're very likely to be the same. And that seems intuitively, like, probably not wrong. Um, so that's, that's why we care about entropy, because that entropy tells us how much overlap essentially there is. So we can use that as a, as a test to say how good is it to merge um, these two documents together. So that means, now that we have that, um, that we can use that as basically an objective and just do a search, right? So like we could, and we actually could, um, say okay, for each uh, possible clustering, 
right? So for each way it, that you can group documents together, um, how much entropy is there in each of the documents you grouped, uh, try all the possible clusterings, and uh, pick the one that has the lowest entropy, right? And, and that would totally work, but it would also be extremely slow. Um, so we can't do that. So what do we do? There's a trick. Make all algorithms O1 with this one weird trick your professors don't want you to know. <laughs> What's the trick? Sampling. So uh, if you have a fixed amount of data, it doesn't matter what you're doing to it, it's O1. So uh, basically what we're doing is we're, we're uh, clustering things in two steps. The first step uh, is big and expensive and like almost brute force, but we're doing it on a sample of the data, so that's fine. Um, and that uh, is called the initialization step. And then we have the separate step uh, that is faster, um, that we can run all the data, um, that assumes that we've already done the first step. Um, so we have these two phases. We have initialization uh, and we have incremental. Okay, so how do these phases work? Uh, well, in the initialization step, the first thing we need to do is we need to make our sample of the data. Uh, and that leads to the question, well, how big should the sample be, right? I mean, obviously we can't make a sample un unless we know how big it is. Um, and this is kind of non-obvious um, because we have a trade-off here. Uh, on the one hand, we wanna have as few things uh, in the sample as possible because we're gonna be doing a big expensive thing to it and obviously we don't want that to be slow. Um, so we want to minimize the number of things that are in the sample. But on the other hand, um, we want to make sure that we have at least one uh, example of each cluster that we want to have uh, in our sample, because if we don't, then we'll miss clusters. Um, because the whole point of doing this initialization step is to find the sort of starting points for our clusters that then later on we can take uh, documents and just figure out which of these already started clusters to put the document into. Uh, so we need to have at least one example for each of our clusters. Um, and so how do we figure out how big a sample we need? Uh, well, it turns out statistics comes to the rescue and we can actually just, um, they have a formula that tells you how big a sample uh, you need, which they derived from uh, you know, a very old statistics thing from the 19th century. Um, and they referenced a proof somewhere in the paper. They didn't actually put the proof in the paper, but um, basically uh, this formula tells you, okay, if you know, uh, so we wanna know the size of the sample. Uh, we assume, and I'll actually get to this later, but for now let's say that we assume that we know how many clusters we want. Um, we don't necessarily what, know what they represent, but we know how many we want. So that's K. Um, we have the probability that we didn't miss anything um, which is a knob that we get to turn. So we can set that to whatever number we're comfortable with, you know, 95% uh, or 90% or 80% or, or whatever. Um, and then we have that term, the sort of weird P um, term there, uh, which is size of the data set divided by the number of clusters divided by the size of the smallest cluster, right? So we need to know the size of the data set and we need to know the size of the smallest cluster. Um, and that actually has a nice property because um, since we're dividing the size of the smallest cluster by the size of the data set, and since that's the thing that this whole equation is getting basically scaled by, um, as long as the size of the smallest cluster uh, gets bigger in proportion to the size of the data set, we actually don't need to increase our sample size as we get more data. Um, we can, you know, keep having the size of the of the sample be the same, even if, you know, as we have like we go from ten thousand to a hundred thousand to a million records. Um, as long as the size of the smallest cluster goes from one to 10 to 100 as we do that. Um, so okay, we have this formula that came down from the sky that, that tells us uh, how big a sample we need, great. So we can get our sample. And now that we have our sample, what do we do to it? Uh, so again, the goal of the initialization step is we need to have the cluster seeds, we need to have the starting points for each of our clusters, right? We need to know what are the different uh, things, the different uh, sort of distinct uh, entities that we're trying to classify observations into um, that, that we wanna have. Um, and so what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we take each pair 
of uh, records in our sample, and we say, or we ask the question, um, how good would it be, based on the entropy thing I said before, how good would it be to merge these together? And the two that would be the worst to merge together, we start as separate clusters. And so we say, okay, those are, in a certain sense, the edges of our map, right? They're the farthest apart. So, right, we plant a flag here, we plant a flag there, and then, uh, you know, k times, or I guess k minus two times, um, so basically for the rest of the clusters that we want, um, we go through and we say, right, uh, we want to start a new cluster. What document are we going to pick to be the starting point for that cluster? Uh, we go through all of our records, and for each record, we say which one is least, which one would be the worst to put in any of the clusters we already have based on our entropy metric. Uh, we pick the one that would be the worst, and we put it in its own cluster, right? And we just keep doing that until we have, each cluster has one example that is the seed for that cluster, right? So that's the big expensive thing that we were doing on our sample, so we do that. And then uh, we have some leftovers, right? And, and, and the incremental step is what we're gonna be doing to the leftover stuff that was in our sample, because the number of things in the sample is probably bigger than K. Um, so the leftovers that we had in our sample, and uh, also any other data that we have that wasn't in the sample, and any future data that we might get. Um, and so now we, we know what clusters we, we have, right? So we have uh, a starting point for each of the uh, different kinds of things that it's possible to represent. Um, and so our job now is to take the rest of the records and for each one figure out where does it go? Which of the existing clusters should I put this in? And so to do that, um, again, we have our, you know, based on, based on entropy, we have our uh, function that tells us how much overlap is there, how good would it be uh, to put a particular record into a particular cluster, and we just, for each, uh, each record that we see, we look at each cluster and we say, how good would it be, and we take the one that would be the best and we stick it there, so it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we're only doing that, you know, for each of these records, we're only doing one comparison to, you know, that, that cluster represents the sort of uh, sum total of just the fields, right? It's not like all of the examples of all the records are in there, it's just here are the distinct uh, attribute value pairs uh, in, that, in that set. Um, and we're, so we're only doing one comparison for each of those, right? So it's, it's a lot cheaper um, than if we were like doing that pairwise thing, right? For, uh, for the entire data. Um, and yeah, we just keep doing that until uh, all the data has some place to live. Um, and then anytime we get new data, we do the same process, right? For each cluster, where does it go? Um, pick the best one, that's where it goes. Um, so I said before that uh, I would get to the question of like, okay, let's say we don't necessarily know how many clusters we want, right? So uh, the CoolCat paper sort of makes the assumption that you know how many clusters you want. Um, and maybe you do. Um, you know, let's say, for example, that uh, you have one data set that is like canonical gold standard um, and another data set that's messy crap and uh, you want to uh, just take the messy crap and then assign it to one of the gold standard records, right? So you know how many things there are because gold standard said so and so K is the number of things that are in the gold standard data set. Um, so in that case, you know K, but that's pretty rare. Like, usually you have crap on one side and crap on the other um, and you're trying to put the crap together. Um, and so you have no idea what K is. I mean, you could guess, but, but you don't really know. So there's this, this other paper um, that sort of builds on top of this paper um, called the Best K for Entropy-Based Categorical Data Clustering by Kiki Chen and Ling Liu. Um, and they basically have a solution to this problem, which is um, we start with a very high K. They actually start with K being the number of things in the data set, right? So, uh, they start out with each cluster only having one thing in it. Um, and then it turns out that that metric that we have to say uh, how good is it to put a given document into a given cluster, um, because our documents are sets of attribute value pairs and our clusters are also sets of attribute value pairs, 
uh, we can essentially use that same metric to say how good would it be, or a very similar one, to say how good would it be to merge two clusters together. So basically, if uh, taking two, two clusters uh, and merging them together does not increase the uh, total amount of entropy too much, um, then we should do it. And so basically what we do is uh, we do the initialization step, um, like I said before, uh, and we have more clusters than we actually want. Um, and then we go through and we say, right, for each pair of clusters, can I get away with merging these together? If I merge these together, is it gonna make the entropy worse? And then uh, we keep doing that um, until you know, we hit some threshold of like, okay, if I merge these together, the entropy will go up too much. Um, and so then we stop, right? And now you have the number of clusters being based actually on the data. Um, you don't just have to pull it out of your butt. Um, you can actually run an algorithm over the data that, that has some, some basis in sort of what's there um, and then use that to, to determine the number of clusters. Um, so, cool. So let's say that, that right, I, this has all been pretty abstract, right? This has just been talking about like the actual algorithm. Um, but let's say that we actually want to build something. That, like, what would this be actually useful for? Um, so this is a product, product that sadly is no more, but um, I worked on at one point. Um, this was Priceonomics. Um, and basically what it did was uh, we would crawl uh, all different places that had used products for sale. So we would crawl eBay, we would crawl Amazon, um, we would crawl Craigslist, we would crawl various other places. Uh, we would pull out the product listings and then we would make pages that look like this. So uh, this is from the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. There's supposed to be a picture there. There isn't because it is lost to the sands of time. But um, basically, uh, we take all of the uh, occurrences of Dyson DC25 vacuum cleaners um, that exist on all places that sell used things um, and we say, okay, uh, the average price in Craigslist is this, the average price in eBay is that, the average, average price on Amazon is such and so. Here are some examples of places you can get it cheap. Uh, in your city, it's cheaper to get it on, on Craigslist than it is to get it on, on eBay, but not by very much, so maybe it's not worth the trouble. Um, so let's say we wanted to use CoolCat to, to build this, right? How would we do that? Um, well, okay, first thing we do is we get the data. Right, and so we write a crawler, and crawlers are pretty much all look basically the same, right? We have a queue. Uh, it has some way of, of representing what URLs we've crawled before. Maybe that's a Bloom filter. Um, we have a bunch of crawler nodes. What the crawler nodes do is they fetch a web page, extract the data from the web page, write the data to some store, let's say it's S3, take the links from the web page, put them on the queue, pull another link off the queue. Right? And they just do that all day long. So we have these things, they crawl this website, they pull out all this data that we've extracted. We need to uh, turn those web pages into those attribute value pairs I said before, but you can do that and people do do that with uh, XPath and regular expressions. Um, and possibly evaluating the JavaScript, I don't know, I think people do that. Um, but Okay, so it goes through this mess, and then out of the mess you get, you get attribute value pairs. So now we have these attribute value pairs, which look uh, kind of like that thing. Actually, the, the example data that I showed you before was literally a scrape of Amazon, right? It was a scrape of Amazon that you can download from a university website, but it was a scrape of Amazon, right? So um, we have those, those uh, data records, um, and we spool them to S3. And then once we have that, we probably want to do some sort of map reduce. And maybe, maybe you do that with EMR uh, if you like shoveling money into the Amazon money furnace. Um, maybe you roll your own, I don't know. But um, basically, uh, let's assume that we have uh, some way of doing a linear scan um, over the data that we've, we've stuck into uh, S3. And so what do we do? Well, we do a linear scan over the data to make our sample. And if you're doing that in, in MapReduce, that would be a map job. Um, and then we take the data from that um, and we stick it on a single machine. Um, and in MapReduce, that would probably be a reduce, although you could also just do it on a single machine, right? You could take the sample, spool it out somewhere, and then suck it in. 
Um, so we run our, our initial clustering on, on there. Um, and that gives us our starting points for our clusters. So out of that, we're gonna get uh, one or maybe a couple examples for each product that exists. Um, and then once we have that, we take our initial clustering and we do another map back over S3, so that's that cluster thing up top. So we do another map, we, holding onto the initial clustering, scanning over all the data that's in S3, um, and for each uh, data item that we see in S3, we do our comparison to each of the clusters that are from the initial clustering, which one is it the best to put in. Um, we decide which one it's the best to put in, um, and then what we output is our uh, sets of here's all the information for, for that particular cluster, right? That's what, what um, gets spit out, or if, if it was a single map, it would probably actually be uh, data records annotated with a cluster ID. Um, and if you wanted to group it the other way, you would do a reduce. Um, but okay, so this map reduce thing spits out our clustering, and then we have a boring old, you know, shove it in a database, maybe the database is even flat files, um, and have a web server. This is like, Boring, okay. Um, so like put, uh, putting all that stuff together, we got, we got this big old thing, which I don't you expect you to be able to read the like labels in the individual nodes, but um, they're the same as you just saw. Um, so data comes in from the crawler, gets spooled to S3, we sample it and do our initial clustering sometimes, um, like whenever we feel like it. Um, and then we take the initial clusters, uh, we do the full clustering, we write that out to the database. Um, and then we might also wanna have a fast path. So um, this initial clustering has to, has to, or this full clustering has to do a scan over all the data, uh, which might be kind of expensive and kind of slow. Um, and this crawler is running all the time and it's finding fresh stuff all the time, right? And so ideally, um, like for example, if somebody posts uh, a particular used product for sale on Craigslist, you wanna be able to tell someone that it just got posted a minute ago, you should email them right now so you can get in ahead of other people who might be trying to buy it. Um, and obviously having a, a month like batch job that runs over all the data is not gonna let you do that. Um, but actually one of the cool things about CoolCat is because it has the separate incremental step, um, what we can do is we can take our initial clustering that we made and we can shove it back in the crawlers. And we can have the crawlers, uh, when they see uh, new data records, do the same uh, incremental step to ask the question, okay, what, what cluster ID does this go in? Um, and find the best one. And then take that data record um, and stick it in the D DB with uh, a cluster already attached. So that shows up on the web page for, like, for example, if it was that Dyson vacuum cleaner, um, it would show up on the web page for that particular Dyson vacuum cleaner straight away. Um, and so that would do that. And then probably we would, we would still wanna run, so we would have the ability to um, cluster new data as it came in, uh, but we would probably still wanna run the big batch thing periodically because um, that set of clusters that we have um, represents a sort of snapshot in time of uh, all the products that exists, and so we wanna be able to have the ability to, to find new products that came into existence that we'd never seen before. Um, and so we probably re wanna, you know, we probably wanna do the initial clustering over again um, at some cadence, maybe, I don't know, months, once a month or whatever, um, to come up with our new cluster seeds, uh, which we can then use to recluster everything. And if there's something that, you know, maybe got mis misclustered before, because you know, we didn't know that the product existed, now it's in the right place. And anytime we see a new thing that represents uh, a new product that uh, we didn't know existed, uh, we know where to put it correctly now. Um, so cool, I went really fast. But um, yeah, that's, that's basically the talk. Um, so yeah, if people have questions or comments or thinly veiled sales pitches, um, now would be the time. Yeah, so there are, uh, so the question was, what if we use the, 
yeah, what if we use Jacquard distance um, as our similarity measure instead of entropy? And there are actually entity resolution algorithms that do that. Um, that works better if you're trying to do basically string matches. So uh, the sort of use cases for, and I forget the names, but there are, I think it's like, there's one that ends with plus plus. I forget, it starts with a J and ends with plus plus, I don't remember the name. Um, but there is an entity resolution uh, algorithm that uh, uses Jacquard distance, um, or does that one use Levenshin? There's, there's one that uses Jacquard and one that uses Levenshin um, distance. But basically they're for the case where uh, the things that are the same, the records are almost identical. Like most of, most of the fields are there most of the time. Um, and we're trying to catch, you know, data entry type errors. Um, and this is better suited for uh, the data is much messier. We have a lot of partial information, you know, like what you would get from a web scrape. Um, and so, you know, we want to have uh, a metric that's a little bit more loosey goosey. Not this paper, no. So, so uh, the Kenemily paper I read to, to, yeah, it was like when I was 17, it was the first CS paper I read, which, by the way, it's an awesome paper, you should read it. Um, if you're at all interested in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, anything, like Kenemlia, it's, it's a distributed hash table, uh, but it's one of the classic distributed hash table uh, implementations. It's one of the few ones that actually gets shipped in real software. Um, like, it's, it's in, in Kazaa, it's in BitTorrent, um, I think it's in Skype. Um, like you probably have some piece of software on your computer that uses it. But anyway, I, so that was just like, that was what, what got me started reading CS papers was, was that one. So uh, the, the question, uh, if I understood, if I understood the question, the question is: Is the initialization, initialization step guaranteed to, guaranteed to find a clustering that minimizes the total entropy? Um, so, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I, I I don't think I could write a proof right now to 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 say that that's the case. But if you think about what it's doing, um, it's comparing the entropy of each. Uh, each pair, well, yeah, initially it's comparing the entropy of each pair, but, but it's, it's almost um, moving along a gradient. You could sort of think of it that way, right? Because you start with the ones that are farthest apart. Um, so you know that, that all the ones that are, ra that are left over um, aren't going to be as far apart as those two are. Um, and then you're, you're taking the next one and saying which one is, is farthest apart from those. So, um, yeah, is it, is it optimal? Um, I don't know, but I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but I, you're right, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not trying every possible, uh, every possible clustering and compu computing the total entropy for the whole thing on each step. It is, it is cheating a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think the the short answer is I don't know, but I think yes. What? Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Can you say that louder? Right, so, so the, the, um, the question is, uh, the incremental step isn't that dependent on the order in which you scan over the data that you're putting in the clustering uh, because the sort of objective that you're using to decide what, what cluster to put a record in is dependent on what clusters exist. 
Um, and if you put things in clusters in a different order, you might end up in a different state when you ask that question, and you might end up with a, with a, a different answer. Um, I think that's probably true, but I think that, so it, it's, it's, not, it's not stable, right? I mean, it's not gonna give you the same answer every time for, for all possible orderings, but I think the, the clusterings that you're gonna get are gonna be more or less equally good. Right. Right. So, like, they also talk about, you know, retoxing this ACTP batch by first taking it out of patient A. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, so apparently they do actually address that in the paper, and yeah, I think they do. Thank you, Bob. So there's cupcakes, there's more drinks. Uh, I think that we're too big to go to a bar, but if you want to lunge around for a little bit, we're not going to kick you out, but we will kick you out eventually. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Next month, we are doing it, on a, I think, on a Wednesday. So, so just come back again. Thanks. <laughs>